I'm here with Aviation Consumers Senior Editor Rick Durden. Rick, you and I have been tag team in the used aircraft guide uh, reports in Aviation Consumer. We were just talking for uh, almost better part of 20 years now. We look at model history and an important part of uh, our reporting is the accident reports. And in general, we go through the most recent 100 reports that made the NTSB database. Anything stand out in your mind from what you've looked at recently? Well, it wasn't that. We just uh, finished doing the Cessna 210 and the P210. And one of the things, those have a, both of those have a pretty good safety record. However, if there is a spot to be examined and watched carefully as an owner, it's the landing gear. The system doesn't have a backup. If you lose a hydraulic line uh, and drain the hydraulic fluid, you can't get the gear down, which means that you need to be really assertive in preventive maintenance on that system, making sure that the hydraulic lines and all the valves are in good shape. Uh, because while nobody's, you know, you can't get the gear down, all right, you got to make a gear up landing. It's going to be expensive. Fortunately, nobody gets hurt as long as you leave the engine running. Um, but that adds to the insurance costs in the two tens, and it's just no fun when you select gear down and the gear goes in a trail position and stops there. So on a two ten item one that we look at hard is uh, is the gear in good condition. The second is that there are a slightly higher than what we think of as average number of fuel exhaustion cases, and that's been tracked back to the fact that there's not much dihedral and you've got big tanks in those wings. So you've got to have the airplane sitting level uh, side to side and fore and aft to get the tanks full. And you need to take your time. You run the, you know, you fuel the tank all the way up to the top and make sure it's to the top, not to just the bottom of the filler neck. And we've had line boys do that thinking they were topping it off. And then wait a minute, go over to the other tank, fill it, come back to the first one. And the chances are you're going to be able to put a few more gallons in it. And I've had a situation where I was 10 gallons less than full, and I thought the airplane was full. We could, I put that much more into it. So those are, I guess, two items on the, uh, the 210 to watch. Runway loss of control seems to be popular among all models for the most part. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. Almost invariably, the... Uh, the greatest number of accidents when we do our 100 uh, in the hit parade is runway loss of control. All almost always on landing, although uh, there are some airplanes that have the pilots have trouble on takeoff. But it we see it again and again and again. And these are airplanes that range all over the place in in reputation for being easy or hard to handle. Uh, for example, the Cessna 150, 172 have a high runway loss of control rate, even though those are easy airplanes to fly. But we've chalked that up to the fact there's a lot of students flying those airplanes uh, and it causes it. If you go tailwheel, and yes, we talk about how tailwheel pilots are so much better than nose wheel pilots, but tailwheel pilots wreck their airplanes about three times the rate of nose wheel pilot on landing. So if you're going to go tailwheel, uh, the admonition is get good training and for all for anything get good recurrent training and do it frequently and learn how to position the ailerons for a crosswind we there was uh well there have been some videos of crosswind landings at oshkosh and you watch the good pilots handling the crosswind they keep the aileron deflection in all the way until they're turned off the runway and then you watch guys that manage to touch down the ailerons go to the center and up comes a wing, and they stick the other wing on the ground, and around they go. But uh, I guess that's one almost any kind of airplane you have, I'll say, other than maybe the Piper Lance series, which has a real low runway loss of control uh, accident rate. Anything else you're flying, recurrent training is the, the cheapest insurance you can buy uh, frequently and with an instructor is going to have you do a lot of landings and have you do a lot of crosswind landings. And I'll, I'll toss in a pitch right here for the Redbird crosswind simulator. There's not a lot of them out there, 
but it is, I mean, in 20 to 30 minutes on that thing, you will improve your crosswind landing skills like you wouldn't believe. So if you have one around, it's uh, worth spending a few bucks uh, yeah. up on the skill level. But the insurance companies have been pretty clear uh, in a hardened insurance market. You think they got it right in, in asking for more training? Oh, I, I think so. The insurance companies are, are the one looking every day at the bottom line of what they're paying out for the bent metal. And they're looking at cause and effect relationships. And, and we've seen it, you know, just looking at the accidents we look at every month. It seems like that as soon as a pilot is more than a year from his last flight review, his risk of an accident starts to really climb, especially a landing accident. The professional pilots have to take recurrent every six months and look at the result. We haven't had a fatal American airline accident in 10 years. Our corporate and part 135 operations are pretty close to that. Our general aviation accident rate is pretty much the same as riding a motorcycle. What's the difference? It's that recurrent training. And I, you know, I, I mean, most of my friends are general aviation pilots. And what I look at is so often, hey, I'm coming up on my 24 months. Can you go fly with me for a flight review? Well, yeah, but you've only got two more days left and thunderstorms are forecast that whole time. I want to, I recognize that the power of positive procrastination, but you just dropped uh, $12,000 on new avionics for your airplane. Can you afford to spend 400 bucks every six months for uh, a little duel and a flight review? And I think that's going to keep you safer and reduce the risk of you hurting that airplane uh, more so than that. The avionics you just dropped a ton of money on. You know, you and I uh, often shake our heads sometimes when we see some of these, uh, some of the things that happen post-accident. And uh, we were talking just recently uh, about a landing gone bad, uh, maybe a Mooney or a Comanche or something, whatever it might be, ends up in the weeds, banged up pretty good. And next thing you know, it's being stuffed into a hangar and the hangar door closes and the lights go out. <laughs> You know, you've you've always had some good advice about what to do, what not to do. If you do end up breaking an airplane, you know, we're all human and it can well, happen. <laughs> that's true. And I've got to give a shout out to Caldwell, Idaho, where what was it, a week or 10 days ago, Alaska went off the runway and flipped. And a whole crowd of people went out there, righted, it, right, righted the airplane, damaging it some more, and ran it into a hangar. Well, there's witnesses. They think they're going to be able to hide this. Um, I doubt it. Uh, I mean, the fact that people are already talking about it now and making jokes about it, uh, trying to hide the fact that you tore up an airplane is kind of a losing proposition. And I, as an attorney that defended pilots for a lot of years, I don't know how many times the FAA got word that the pilot had had an accident or had broken a leg because it's usually a male his girlfriend or wife got mad at him and turned him in. So the rule of thumb is if you have an accident, uh, one, make sure that if there's anybody injured, get medical help. That's the absolute way to stop. And then two, take a minute and think. If you're at a busy airport, there's going to be all sorts of things running around. The airport manager may be there. Uh, before the airplane gets moved, um, you're going to have to get hold of the NTSB and see if you can get permission to move it. Uh, the FAA may uh, may get involved there. But at this point, it's time to take your time a little bit. Okay, you've landed gear up and stopped at the intersection of two runways. You've got the airport shut down. People are yelling and screaming to move the airplane. That's probably going to happen. It's going to have to get moved but do it in a fashion to try to reduce the additional damage. Get hold of your insurance company. And once you have the air, the wreckage secured, you've got people that's, that have been injured uh, getting treatment, then you start thinking about yourself. The FAA may want to talk to you. The NTSB may want to talk to you. Uh, after an accident, either even a minor one, and I'm not going to kid you, 
the FAA walks up to you and is going to say, what day is it? And you're going to say Wichita. And you're going to think that you gave a normal answer. You are not functioning at 100% right then. Do not, under any circumstance, talk about the accident with anybody uh, in an official capacity. Call not obligated. Navy. There's no obligation. And at some point you will talk to them, but there's no obligation to talk to them that day. Yeah. And you just simply say, and, the, and every single FAA and NTSB person I've spoken to, when someone says to them, hey, look, I'm a little shook up here. Let's talk tomorrow or the next day. Let's make an appointment on when we're going to talk. They always say yes. Uh, they can get in big trouble for, for pushing, pushing you too hard. Um, get hold of an aviation attorney. If you don't know one, get hold of the AOPA. Their pilot protection services will help you find one. Talk to a, an attorney before you talk to the FAA. Talk to your insurance folks to make sure the airplane's protected. And then just take your time. And there are good checklists out there on what to do after an accident. Because you also need to look at how badly the airplane is damaged because it may not be an accident. And so there may be no reporting requirement. The fact that um, the NTSB regs on damage are written pretty much to rule out a gear up landing as a reportable accident. The NTSB doesn't want to hear about the minor stuff. They've got too much stuff on their plate. Yeah. So you go slide into a stop because you forgot the gear. Before the airport manager gets on the phone to the FAA, tell them to stop. You know, hang on, this may not be a reportable accident. So take your time on that. If it is a reportable accident, of course you report it. But, um, you know, don't go handing somebody a gun to point at your head when it's not necessary. Yeah, you know, and even before all that, do you think some pilots buy the wrong airplanes? You know, you and I have, have talked about just one example off the top of my head is the Aviat Husky. Uh, yeah. Good, good outback airplane, rugged airplane, plenty of power. And I've talked to Husky owners and I've talked to uh, some folks that give specialized Husky training. And their comment is uh, a number of folks that buy these as second and third airplanes uh, scare themselves. They, Husky is very capable, but it will do what you tell it to do right now. And if you tell it to do the wrong thing, um, your opportunity to fix that may be a pretty brief window. On one hand, uh, we've looked at uh, tailwheel aircraft landing accidents for a lot of airplanes. The Husky has the highest rate of nose overs. Now, we don't know whether that's because it's got really good brakes or the uh, geometry of the landing gear or when you slow down, if you've got full aft elevator, it doesn't give you a lot of tail down force. I don't know, or a combination of those things. But uh, Husky, you want to be a little cautious when you were trying to, to uh, stop short. The, and it's also a very popular airplane for short takeoff competitions. However, if you look at the, and, and when you're doing short takeoffs, you're, you're using full flaps but it has long span flaps and short ailerons. If you look at the POH for the airplane, it calls for flat crosswind takeoffs to be flaps up. And what we've seen is that we believe based on our observations there that there have been at least a half a dozen uh, takeoff accidents at Huskies in a crosswind where the, it took off with full flaps uh, and tried to climb aggressively and they developed an uncommanded roll and rolled in, into the ground. So we, on the Husky, again, I like it, I really like flying it, but uh, I think it's very important that you follow the POH for flap setting and takeoff and landing technique. Sometimes when we look at turbines in the user aircraft guide, we see folks that may not take that upgrade seriously enough. Any advice for those stepping into a turbine for the first time? Well, uh, Fortunately, your insurance company is almost certainly going to require that you go through simulator-based training. And if you find yourself saying, hey, I don't need that, uh, I'll, you know, how about 
airplane-based training, it's a red flag. The turbine world, but on one hand, the turbines have a lot more power. So if you do something wrong on landing, it will help bail you out. You get the TBM or something like that. It, you've got the power to go around um, in some pretty grim circumstances. But at the same time, the token, you've got that power and things start happening much, much faster. And getting used, there's a, there's a learning curve in getting used to how quickly this airplane moves and your thought process, okay, what's happening now? What comes next? What comes next? What comes next? And oh, now I'm getting ice. And all right, let's see, do I have, okay, how do I turn the, is it anti-ice or is it de-ice? And do I have to do something to protect the engine? Um, it's a newer world and it's happening fast. I'm into the clouds and ice can start building up really quickly. Uh, yeah, the, well, fortunately, we haven't seen too, over the last few years, too many hold my beer and watch this turbine accidents uh, with insurance requiring better training, but they're still out there. Uh, I remember a citation accident, uh, well, it's been several years back now, the guy had his runway right, or the hangar right by the runway, uh, low day, he fires up, taxis out, single pilot, he didn't give time for the um, the AHARs and the gyros and so forth to erect. He pushed the power levers from quiet to noisy, rotated into the clag, and he uh, got to about 500 feet before he rolled. Uh, there was spatial disorientation and the fact that his presentations weren't working yet. So um, I don't know what training he had, but he hadn't been in a citation over a long time. And last, sometimes pilots are their own worst enemies. Uh, over at sister publication, IFR Magazine, we've got a uh, annual feature called Stupid Pilot Tricks. And uh, it's a tongue in cheek look at some of the stupid things that, uh, that pilots do in airplanes. We see folks flying without certificates, aircraft that aren't airworthy. It's, it's scary. I mean, well, it is on one hand, you've got the guy who doesn't have a pilot certificate never has had any, even a student certificate. He's taken his friend for his ride, a ride in his 150. But he's one of these guys that doesn't like seat belts. So on the takeoff roll, he manages to run off the left side of the runway and hit the fence. The guy in the right seat who's strapped in is uninjured. The guy in the left seat flying the airplane uh, has very serious injuries that kill him two weeks later. Um, we've got, I mean... Guy takes off uh, from a farm strip in his Cessna 120, and he sees his cousin running a combine in the next field. So it's time to fly by and say hi. You know, well, okay, yeah, that 500 foot rule doesn't apply to me. It's my, it's family. Um, well, he makes the low pass, and then instead of pitching up, he rolls into a turn, sticks a wing into the ground, and cartwheels. Uh, he was strapped in, so he wasn't hurt, but again and again and again. The guy in the 206 that sticks his family in it for the first flight after maintenance, this is one that really gets me. I, I'm pretty cognizant on first flights after maintenance. Takes off in a cross country. EGT on one of the cylinders drops off and his airspeed drops 23 knots. He keeps going. The engine starts to run rough so he decides to land and have it worked on. No mechanic at the airport. So he fills up the airplane with fuel and gets all the people back in the 206. Starts a takeoff roll, engine just doesn't sound right. So he taxis back and takes off. At 250 feet, it quits for good. Uh, you know, the, this, we, I see the, the magical thinking on, oh gee, yeah, the engine quit on takeoff, but, and I got it stopped. Um, so I'll do a run up. Oh, okay, it's fine. It's cured itself again and again. Uh, 2024 issue of IFR magazine if you want to read the stupid pilot tricks uh, feature and of course the uh, aviation consumers use aircraft guide is a monthly feature in aviation consumer if you'd uh, like to see an aircraft cover that we haven't covered in a while drop us a note and uh, we'll take a look at it you've been watching uh, aviation consumers live coverage here we zoomed up with uh, senior editor Rick Durden thanks for watching